Good afternoon, Hannah. It's so nice to see you today. How are you doing? I am so happy to be here talking to you, Kara. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. So it's a lovely sunny Thursday afternoon in, on both fronts, actually. And I don't always get to say that when uh, my friends are joining from sunshiny places um, in their own right. Um, when we were, you know, logging on earlier, you mentioned a scone crawl today. I, we have to go there for a second before we do anything else, because I want to know your power rankings. I want to know what went down. You know, have you always loved scones? What was the mission? <laughs> it's this is I love I love that we're starting here. Scones have a very special place in my heart. I um, have always loved teas and having tea and going to tea. And it's just yeah been a, something that I think did with my mom when I was little and she started reading me the Eloise books when I was very very young and so Eloise has a, a strong strong pull and an influence on my my being and I seem to remember that even if Eloise herself wasn't eating scones all the time at the Plaza Hotel in New York of course where she lives she has the the great scones there and so I do love a good scone um some really critical things icing is an immediate disqualification I don't need icing on my scones I think that's valid I like that it's it's a jam a lemon curd situation maybe some clotted cream period don't need icing so there were no <laughs> iced scones purchased on this crawl valid important this is a Thank good you. criteria <laughs> yeah yeah it's important to have criteria when you're on a crawl right because otherwise the options are endless I you know I'm gonna pull it right back here it's like artists talk about needing parameters right, right. and that sometimes working within parameters is really helpful so the icing is my parameter and there I you, go. There. you applied this great expertise that you have from the arts world and project management to strategizing this scone crawl to be enjoyable, to be time limited, to achieve your goals of maximum satisfaction, Eloise style. And I like, oh my gosh, like Eloise is my love language. I mean, she is the most important person to me in the whole world. Like I don't, I've never had this opportunity. And I interviewed Michael Story, who's like a resident artist at the Plaza. And we didn't talk oh. about Louise. And like, this <laughs> is just making my day. She is my idol. I mean, if I could be anyone in the world, it would be Eloise at six years old. That like melody of the books too is just so, do you know the backstory to Eloise? You know, I, I feel certain that I once did, but I think I have forgotten it. So please share. I think this is worth it. Yeah. So there, um, was it Kay Thompson who wrote the books? Mm -hmm. So my understanding, and I read this book about the plaza a long time ago, so I could have, you know, changed the story myself at this point, but I think she like sang in the jazz club downstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, and now it's like the Rose bar or the champagne bar or something. I don't remember what it was called then the Persian room, the Persian room, I think. And when she would finish her set, she would have drank a bit, I guess. And she'd go back to her room and she'd make prank phone, prank phone calls as if she was a six-year-old girl named Eloise who lived in the plaza. So like this beautiful, precious children's book is the result of this singer drinking a little bit too much and Frank phone calling her friends. And like, I just, I like, like it even more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know what I love about that is it, it, it makes it really accessible. Being a six-year-old who lives in the plaza is probably not a, a goal that's um, accessible to me anymore at this point in my life. However, singing in a jazz club and, and calling a friend. Wine. I can do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think we need to make an Eloise 2.0. This has always been a dream of mine. And maybe now this is our, <laughs> this, is it. This, this is it. Is it. We just need a skipper D and then we're good to go. And we're good to go. And some scones for all the strategy sessions. And we're going to get Kate looped in. It's going to be so exciting. We have our, I'm, oh my God, I'm over the moon. So excited. <laughs> Well, I've done a lot of, um, you know, building up to who you are. Everyone's like, who's Hannah? What is going on with Eloise? This is Hannah Jacobson of Blumenfeld, fundraising board and strategy consulting and arts project management extraordinaire expert person, but also like this, I mean, and even better at those things because you're so fun and lovely and like full of cool ideas. And I think 
this intro has kind of been a testament to all that you bring to these roles that maybe sound a little bit more um, suit and tie front office kind of things. But I'm just so excited to understand the expansiveness of what you do and how you've gotten here. And I thank you so much for being here today. I, I love getting to talk about uh, these as interconnected and interrelated pieces, because to me, you know, I was, I was actually doing a, I was doing a guest lecture yesterday and we were talking about some local projects and then national projects that I've worked on because I've done a little bit of ping-ponging between really, really local, hyper-local things and then national and um, spanning all kinds of different avenues of supporting the arts. And one thing that was really resonating with me as I was talking with folks yesterday was how much of a through line there is, no matter what you're working with, whether it's a really, really tiny on the ground community-based arts organization, or it's some really national, big policy-oriented um, project, that there are these through lines about the arts that, that I think can really help to guide us and helps situate and ground us in what matters about the work that we're doing. And that's what I'm really excited to explore today. I think it's yes. amazing what you do to bring all of these strands together. And that's how I see what you're doing too. Oh, thank you so much. It, um, you know, connectedness is probably something, you know, aside from Eloise, that means like the most to me, this idea to see links between things that are not, you know, at the forefront of why they exist. And I'm so um, eager to understand that from the lens of like your background and these projects you've done in these different kind of um, local versus national kind of scopes. So um, what I do want to know though, also before we get to that point of the present and all you're bringing to the table right now is like how kind of you've got to figuring out this is where you wanted to be and then how you got here. Like where were you growing up? What were you doing as a kid aside from, you know, reading Eloise or where were you reading Eloise and eating your scones? What was that like? So I grew up doing theater and I think that's a big part of my own sense of the arts as being part of our lives in a really everyday way because theater was my everyday all the time thing that I was doing. It was something I didn't have to worry about a ball being thrown at my face. Um, that was not a space where I felt super comfortable. Uh, so a place I did feel super comfortable was on stage and backstage and with people who were really often very expressive. And it helped me to really come into myself as a person who wanted to be surrounded by the arts. And I think I always knew, even if it a little part of the back of my head thought, you know, maybe one day I'll be on Broadway. I don't think I ever really thought that I was going to be on Broadway. And so I always knew that it was this really precious thing that I just really loved, but it wasn't going to be my job. And I think that's a really special thing to have, um, especially I've been reading a little bit about this, but this idea of having to turn everything we love into a job is Maybe, and I'd never really made this connection before, but I think having theater as something that has never been my job uh, has really helped me to preserve a space where I can always return to, to love the arts. I think it's really easy to get burned out, even if we love what we're doing, and sometimes especially if we love what we're doing. Um, and so I grew up with that as my undercurrent every day. and then my experience of growing up was going to a lot of art museums and seeing art in my community. So I grew up mostly in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we have a fantastic art fair every summer. It takes over downtown. It's wonderful. And I started volunteering at the info booth when I was seven, when we moved to, the, oh uh, to Michigan. And then I stayed with them. I volunteered every single year. And then finally, after about five years, when I was 12, they, they upped me to a juror's assistant, which I did for a few years. And then when I got too old to do that, uh, I started interning with them. And then that 
that was something that I just, I never thought of as arts administration. I didn't realize that what I was doing was arts management. It was just what I did every summer. It was, you know, having the walkie talkie. It was making sure all the artists were set up. It was working with volunteers and anyone who's watching or listening, who's been part of arts management says, oh yes, I've been there. I've set up the folding chairs. I've cleaned glitter out from the bricks uh, because you can't leave glitter out oh, when you're <laughs> when you're outdoors. So yes, I think we all we all have our feelings about glitter if we've worked in a children's art world <laughs> before. Sure. Um, but all of that was just part of what I thought of as my sort of other life. And I didn't, I didn't ever consider it necessarily for what I wanted to do. And then when I got to college, I took an art history class, which is funny because I had never particularly liked art history before, which surprised me because I loved the arts so much, but I thought, well, why should I get history from a picture when I get it from words? It's so much more efficient to get it from words, which of course sounds really, uh, <laughs> really, really tunnel vision to me now, but I just, I didn't really get it. So I'm a little surprised even thinking back and seeing a younger me walking into that art history class and saying, sure, I'm going to take this. And I will say that I was not particularly good at it. I didn't really get it. And my TA saw that. And it's just one of these stories where amazing teachers make all the difference. And I don't know what she saw or why she saw it, but she asked me to stay back one day after section. And she took me to the art museum. And she said, I really just want you to tell me what you see. And she stood me in front of a painting. I think it was a, a sailboat. And she said, what do you see? And I started talking about what I thought the artist was trying to do and what it meant and when it was from and all of this context. And she stopped me and she said, no, I just really want you to tell me what you see in front of you. And so I started talking about the color and the sail on the boat and the fact that there was a boat. And it's, she rolled me back to all of, all of the really fundamental parts of what we see when we're looking at visual art. And of course, there are all kinds of other considerations when we're listening to music or seeing dance or participating in any of these forms. But she really helped me see how critical just the fact that there's a boat, what it, then you can ask, well, what does it even mean that there was a boat? What, what could that mean about a person who was painting that, that they knew what a boat was or had seen a boat or were in a place with a boat? And there are so many fascinating questions to ask once you can take yourself back to this, what you see. And it really changed my whole perception. It changed the course of at least my academic life. And after we stood together for a while there in front of the painting talking, the end of that, she said, it's a language, the visual, the formal, it's a language and you have to learn it and you have to be patient with yourself because we don't learn it from a young age always. Uh, we're not always encouraged in our earlier education to do that, to have that visual language. We have a lot of other kinds of education we get, but that's really where I started to think in a more uh, formal way about the arts. And I can, I can pause there. I realize that's a whole lot. Oh, it's so beautiful. I think that's such a great kind of like um, turning point moment in your life and to have that teacher there was so meaningful. I'm thinking about like any time that I have felt like I wasn't, you know, like I like to be a really good student. I can like tell like, that's probably like part of your story too. And um, you know, when you're not getting something, you're like, I have to go quicker. Like I have to get it now. Like I'm behind already. And there can be this like feeling of urgency that you just kind of rush through it, learn the rules and keep going. And like, clearly that there was like a disconnect happening 
for you and for this teacher to actually be like, no, we have to leave the environment. We don't even, we're not going to even stay in the class and we're going to leave here and do something completely opposite of what feels going to be productive in this moment of like going to the textbook, memorizing more. Um, I just think that that's so important anytime that anyone's in a rut, just like now you have theater to turn to and going as this like space that feels free. Like, oh, if you're in a jam, like leave, like just <laughs> go away from where the jam is happening. And so that's so cool. I love that you say that too, because I think one of the things that made it so special was that she took me into an art space. And I think that so often when we're thinking about arts administration, we're sitting at a desk. Mm -hmm. And even if we're immersed in some ways in the idea of supporting arts or the concept of it, we're not always in a creative space. And I know a lot of us are in our houses, so there isn't always a way to go into a museum. But thinking about ways to place ourselves more in a space of, um, of being recipients of art around us as opposed to trying to create, I think that's what that moment really was about, was that I was receiving as opposed to trying to make something, make meaning out of something. Instead, I, I was receiving that art. And I think that that's been a big part of how my story unfolded after that, because that set me on a path towards art history. And I really fell in love with that. Uh, I thought that I was going to go get a PhD and be a curator. And I took German and I started to really follow that pathway. And then I ended up interning over the summer between junior and senior year of college at the Capitol Hill Arts Workshop in DC. And I have a really long history with Cha because my mom taught there in the 80s. She was a theater teacher and she took tap classes when my parents lived in DC. And that was before I was born. And then they moved to California, which is where I was born. And my mom always told me, we're going back to DC. You're a DC kid and you're going to go to Cha. And I had this giant Cha t-shirt. <laughs> being a toddler and I always wore it and I thought I was going to Cha and then they said never mind we're going to move to Michigan we're not going back to DC so that was a surprise but I had this really strong connection with Cha and so I saw it pop up on uh, the alumni community service fellowship list at Yale where they'll essentially pay for you to go intern over a summer so that the nonprofit doesn't have to pay for the student intern. And I thought, this is the universe telling me something. I better go intern at Cha. I applied and I got it and I went. And it was, I thought it was the first time that I had done arts administration until I thought back on my, uh, on my years with the art fair. But, you know, it was everything from talking to people and getting their stories to pouring paint into smaller things of paint so that kids could have paint and it's it's all the things that you have to do when you're running a small arts organization and I got to see all of them and I got back to school and I talked to my professors and a lot of them were really supportive and one in particular sat me down and said this this kind of work and even if you wanted to potentially do this kind of work in a museum, it's not academic enough and you're not gonna get into a PhD program. And that was really, really hard to hear as you mentioned as a pretty academically minded person um, at the time. And, you know, as a barely not teenager, I really rebelled against this idea. But when I graduated, I didn't apply for a PhD and I did go to DC and I started cobbling together. I was really privileged to be able to cobble together some various arts administration roles and just see what I could do. And when I look back 
on it with a bit more perspective, I think she was right. And perhaps she could have said it in a somewhat <laughs> gentler way, but ultimately she was right. And um, it wasn't my path. And so I, that's how I got to where I am through some of this, uh, some of these surprise moments that sort of hairpin turn you somewhere else. Yes. I think that's um, a cool distinction you get to make though, of like, is this the path that I'm taking because I thought this was the path that I was setting myself up for. And like, I just want to be, you know, consistent to be like, what's the ultimate benefit of being consistent if it's not to be consistent with what you want, like, or can I pivot because I've had this new experience and like bravely let myself prove that I can do something else that I wasn't like actively planning for, but that like has actually been there this whole time. And I have a cousin who is a senior in high school and he's like deciding about his colleges right now. So we were just talking this weekend about the same thing of like, there's this school with this really good um, reputation, right? And there's other school with this great reputation, but like one difference in their reputation. And he loves the one that doesn't have this one cool thing in the reputation. And it's like, well, like you're going to be fine there and you're going to learn more because it's where you are like in love with being. And um, I think that's really cool that even though you were so close to your teenage years, you were able to bravely be like, I am going to rebel against this and I am going to not do the PhD thing right now. And maybe not ever, like, because maybe it's not where I'm supposed to be. So you ended up at the place that your parents had, you know, always dreamed about. And actually this does bring me to one kind of rabbit hole before we miss it. Um, you mentioned that at seven, you started volunteering at that arts fair, right? Was it because your parents saw something in the paper? Like, did you, were you so precocious that you knew that this like thing was out there and you signed up to volunteer at seven? Cause I'm thinking about like, you know, that teacher and that they had this vision for you kind of in one moment. And I'm wondering if your parents had a foresight about your kind of arts passions too. That's, I, I never really thought about it. It's just sort of part of my my personal myth is that I know I was there doing yeah. it. You know, my guess, to be honest, is that the art fair was kind of a, a bribe to get me and my brother to not feel quite so sad about moving across the country. Um, I was seven and he was 11. Just, I don't know, is there is there a great age to move across the country? I'm not sure. But it was a little better for me. I wasn't going into middle school. And so I think that they wanted to make it sound fun and exciting. And I didn't know what I was walking into and I'd never been to Michigan. And I think that they probably told me about the art fair as something that would be fun and exciting to go to when we moved there. And so I think we missed it the first year because we got there a little bit too late that summer. Um, so then the following summer, I'm sure I volunteered with my mom uh, at that info booth. But as I mentioned, you know, I, I started doing theater right around when I moved there. And I think that info booths and talking to people, that was all part of the same sort of thing. It felt like theater. It felt like performing a little bit. Yeah. And so much of theater and performance of theater, at least to me, is about building relationships and trust. And so it's super applicable to any kind of human powered situation. Yeah, I think that's a really cool connection to make. And do you have a favorite theatrical performance, play, musical, kind of anything? <laughs> I love how your eyes There's are that. Oh, oh I, so one of my very, very favorites that just has a, a special place for me is the Fantastics. I've never been in the Fantastics, uh, but I've been listening to that for my whole life. And I picked one of those songs to, for my wedding. I just, I just really, really love it. And I think the characters and Louisa in particular is so wild in some ways and so strong in her sense of what she wants to do and who she wants to be. And I think that that's a really inspiring 
thing for a young person to see. And then also the music is beautiful. So I've always loved it. That's, that's fun. I love that. My sister it loves musicals. Like she plays only music from musicals in her car. And like, it's just a very different background than I have. So I'll be excited to share your favorite with her, see if she's heard it, you know, pass along the recommendation. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome. So you mentioned, so we're at the point of your story where you're graduating college, you decide to jet off to DC, figure it out in arts management kind of stuff. What are these next steps like for you? What happens from there? So after that, I, I worked in, I, I worked with a few different organizations. And again, I think this was the place where I was really looking at some big places and small places. I worked at CHA doing some project management. They were wonderful and let me come back in whatever ways we could figure out. I interned at the National Portrait Gallery with Smithsonian. I worked at a small organization called the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, which has a new name and has really changed since I was there so long ago. And a lot of these, it's really interesting, have come back to me in certain ways. I also interned uh, in policy at Americans for the Arts, which has also circled back to me. Um, and I think that in setting up some of those relationships and learning where I wanted to be in terms of the on the ground work versus the policy work versus the national or the local, because you can have any number of these different combinations in a lot of different kinds of ways. And sometimes big organizations are more like big organizations, even if one's local and one's national, mm -hmm. small to small, same thing. And sometimes there's a real difference between other parts of that matrix. And I think that that experience really helped me to clarify, um, start to clarify where I liked to be. But I think one thing that I want to just pause and say is that what I thought I wanted at any given time, sometimes I'd get into that role and say, this was everything that I wanted. And it still didn't feel right. And I think that it's important to allow ourselves to let that be okay. And that often when I took a job, it was, it was, um, it taught me something and it gave me some path, but there might've been a lot about it. Maybe the majority of it was something I didn't actually like. And that helped me too. And knowing the path forward wasn't always the most helpful thing. Sometimes the most helpful thing was to just notice. And I, I think, you know, I go back to standing in front of that painting that sometimes it's not so much about projecting forward where something will take you, but instead receiving what it is telling you. And I, I think about something a lot that, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I, I ended up, I ended up working as an intern, um, really shifting a lot of my attention to Americans for the Arts, and then I became the executive assistant to the president and CEO. That was my first real full time job, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have told you graduating from college that being an executive assistant was my goal, but doing it gave me so much insight into so much of the organization, this real overarching national view. It was, it's a national policy and advocacy organization. And then I moved into the research department from there. And I loved getting to think about the kinds of best practices, the kinds of things that we can tell arts organizations to do that hopefully can help them advocate for themselves, help support capacity. Ultimately, after three years there, I realized I'm sitting here telling small arts organizations what to do. Meanwhile, I've been at a place like CHA. Is this really going to be actionable for them? I don't know anymore. I feel like I'm untethered from that. And so I left to go to CHA full time um, because I really felt like I had, in some ways at the time, I felt like I'd done it backwards. I felt like I'd 
gone straight to the national without first getting grounding. Now, in some ways, that was a really valuable thing because then I brought all of this bird's eye view to something that can often get a little bit in the weeds. You can really easily get in the weeds when you're trying to keep a small community-based organization going, um, even when it's a wonderful place that has a lot of support, building that capacity. And so I stayed at CHA for several years doing all kinds of things that we can get into. I project managed public art. I was the director of marketing and strategy. I hadn't done marketing before. I learned. Um, then I added development, which added this whole, it opened up the next five years of my life, which was all in development work. And then I was the co-executive director. And, you know, through all of that, I've always loved Cha and I'm really thrilled to be back working with them um, in, in my now life uh, consulting. But sometimes I, I think, you know, through both of those experiences and then other experiences, I had a, a mentor who looked at me when, when I would come to her and say, you know, this should be perfect, but it's not. And I don't know why this should be my dream job. And she just looked at me and she said, you know, sometimes it's a dress rehearsal. And I just, I love that. And I hold that really close to me that, you know, maybe you'll come back to it. Maybe you won't. Maybe this thing that feels perfect or that should be perfect is getting you ready for when you do come back to it someday. And maybe it's a dress rehearsal for something else and all of it's okay. And we all know dress rehearsals are supposed to be terrible because that's good news for the show. So, you know, it, it really helped me to put in perspective when it felt like a job should be right, but wasn't. That's such a cool analogy of the dress rehearsal. And um, I, I can see why it would be such an encouraging one too. I imagine too, like with my less, um, you know, full background in the theater that like in the dress rehearsal, you might realize, okay, this prop actually needs to be moved. You're like, we need to be standing in this different place or this line has to go at a different pace. I think in your story too, you have this really cool ability to reflect at different points on what am I enjoying? What am I not enjoying? Like, what is the next move? I mean, like not, you know, planning out the whole future, but when do I need to leave this role? Right. When do I need to go to the next thing? How purposeful was that reflection or like how, um, how aware were you that you were doing that reflection? What was that reflection process like for you? It was hard. I didn't, when I started out imagining that I was going to go get a PhD, that's a 12 year process for art history or can be seven to 12 years. Um, it's a path, right? It's something that feels very stable in a way that I had intentionally destabilized myself in some ways, but it wasn't something that I had a lot of familiarity with. Um, and I didn't really know what I was doing to go out into a world of not having one job for 40 years. And I think that a lot of people uh, who are Gen X and millennials and others have started to have this experience. And, and by now, I think we're all much more familiar with this idea that we're going to have a lot of jobs in our lives. Probably there are some people who will have one job. And I'm so thrilled that many of my friends are doctors and I would like them to keep being doctors. I think they're great doctors, but a lot of us are not going to have the same job. And that I didn't really have a model for. And so it was, it felt like a lot of explaining externally as well as internally, ultimately, figuring out when something is hard, but important to push through versus hard and a thing that you should let go of is a lesson that I think 
is a forever one. I don't know how comfortable it ever feels or if there's really a right answer to it, which incidentally, creativity really helps us to grapple with things that don't have right answers. Oh, thank goodness for creativity for that reason. Um, but also, yeah, that's a hard question. It makes me curious about like, um, you know, any questions you might ask yourself to figure out, like, am I avoiding this? Cause it's pain, pain that I just don't want to deal with or uh, like pain that will grow me. Right. Or am I really getting this feeling that this is not where I'm supposed to be? Um, I can remember, I guess, a time where I've experienced that too, but I don't know what question I asked. I guess it's kind of like a gut thing. Um, mm -hmm. Was that what it was like for you too? <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes having the space to know that that work and career paths are unlikely to be straightforward anymore was helpful so that it didn't feel like it didn't feel like there was a right answer ultimately because there was a next there there it's only there's there's a huge amount of privilege that i want to call out to being able to say that and to being in a career path that allows for that. Um, so with that, I would say, I think the gut is definitely true. And also a sense that, um, there might be, there might be some of what you mentioned before about being a student and a learner and what is the distinction between when you're not learning anymore mm -hmm. uh, or that learning is not in the direction that you want it to be. Yeah. Oh, I think those are really great insights. So I appreciate you going there with me. Um, the other part of your reflection I thought was really cool was this idea of like, you're in this national organization, making policies, making guidance for micro places where maybe like you mentioned, I think becoming untethered from the micro place. I um, had spent some time in, in the corporate world and there was, you know, teams that built products and there was teams that sold products and used the products and they weren't the same team. And I was like, how can you build a product if you don't know the client? Like, and, you know, to their credit came up with great products. And oftentimes there are things that the client can't think of, right? Because they have this whole different sphere of influence. So I can see where, you know, you coming in with this fresh set of eyes is a great asset, but also um, it sounds like you asserted some like personal responsibility to get informed in a new way too. And I think that was really self, um, self-aware self and, and mature at, you know, that phase in your personal, like professional journey. So you go from, what was it called? Um, the Americans for the Arts, right? And now you're back at, at Cha at this part in the story. And what are some of those projects that you end up working on? At Cha, it was really a, a space of supporting the creativity all around me. The projects that are, I have a lot of uh, longevity with certain projects like the Capitol Hill Alphabet Animal Art Project, which is one of my most favorite public art projects ever. I'm a little biased, but yes. I really, really love it. Um, it. It feels like such a perfect encapsulation of Cha and what it is and who they are. Um, their mission is building community through the arts. And it's so it's just so clear and simple and um, powerful. And the way that this particular project came about was uh, father who lived in the neighborhood was walking around town with his two young daughters. And in DC, our, many of the streets are lettered streets. So, you know, we have A Street and E Street, C Street, all these uh, in each of the quadrants. And he was walking around and he said, look, we're on C Street. C is for cat, cat, C Street. E, E is for emu. We're on E Street. So using the street signs and the letters and animals to teach his kids. And he thought that would be a really fun idea. 
I'm going to take it to Cha. And what I so love about that is that Cha has clearly set itself up as the kind of place where someone could come with a fun and creative and whimsical idea that you wouldn't say is, you know, something that we need to make a policy about or something that needs to, to be more than it is, which is joyful. And that is a policy in itself, right? That is critical, is that we have things like that in our world and in our neighborhoods. And so of course, Cha said, yes, this is a fantastic idea, let's do it. And um, so I helped, that was the first grant that I ever helped to write uh, on in a major way. And then as a result, I got to be part of it from the beginning and got to project manage it and work with these artists and that really opened my eyes to all of the ways in which policy is all around us and partnerships are all around us. And that thinking about supporting the arts, we can't just think about the, the sort of usual suspects of, well, you have, you know, arts funders and the National Endowment for the Arts um, and the state arts agencies and local arts funders. All of those are super important and critical to art support. And what about the general services departments that run buildings? What about space for the arts? What about the Department of Transportation, which is how we ultimately got this project off the ground was through the DC Department of Transportation, DDOT. They've been incredible partners. We got 10 sculptures installed thanks to them. They taught us how heavy the sculptures could be so that they didn't fall and hurt someone. They taught us what materials we could use. They showed us and gave us some of the belts so that we could attach the animals safely and they installed them. They're the same people who install street signs, which is just the coolest to me. And I wanna show a picture. Yes, please. Quickly, because these are actually from, we did a second iteration of this. Um, this is, uh, now we're on to 20 animals. Uh, this is the ant on A Street Southeast and you can see DDOT doing the installation. This was actually in August of 2020. So you will notice we are all in masks. Um, it, it was such a wonderful thing to be able to engage with the arts at a time when it was really hard to be away from them in a lot of ways. Um, so many museums were closed. It was, it was not a time that we could be gathering. So this idea of an outdoor sculpture held even more meaning maybe than it had back in 2014 when the first three went up. But um, you can see just some really wonderful oh. photos of this. And I just love how you can see really clearly in this photo that it's the same installation as the street sign below it, but with such a different character. Um, and I will also just say that I particularly love the ant on A Street because uh, we couldn't decide two artists both wanted A and one wanted to do an ant and one wanted to do this anteater. And we thought how much fun would that be to have them across the street from each other? So they are across the street from each other, this ant and this anteater in conversation. How, where else can you have that? Literally. Oh, I love, I love it. And I, I love the just like kind of random, like serendipitous, like moment of joy for someone who's not aware that this is a thing in DC and they get to A Street and they're like, what the heck? And like, they get to kind of have that smile and the aha and share it with a bunch of people. And I think that's so special. And you mentioned, you know, how your organization, like people knew that this was a place they could go to, or at least that man knew that this is a place could go to, to have this like special idea become a reality. Do you think that people in other towns have these kind of opportunities too? And like, how would they go about even finding their version of Cha? I am so glad you asked that because one thing that I say, it, it is my constant drumbeat and it is that communities know themselves best and that we can learn so much by listening to people who are already in communities. Um, you know, this is, I work with a mutual aid organization as well. And one of the, 
the key, key uh, underpinnings of that work is we keep us safe. And a key underpinning of that is that the solutions already exist in communities. We don't need to come into communities and tell them what to do or point out their problems or solve their problems. We need to support communities, give them capacity, particularly under-resourced communities, particularly communities that face uh, inequities and structural racism in our funding systems, in all of our policies, in all of our systems. And so I think that's really, really critical when we think about the arts and making sure that the arts are equitable and accessible as well, is that yes, these resources exist everywhere because artists exist everywhere. And one thing that um, Amy, the current executive director of CHA says a lot, and, and I keep this at the forefront of my mind as much as possible is let artists lead. And I love that because it's a real reminder that when artists lead and we follow and receive what they are putting out into the world, we can get out of our boxes of what we think will work or what problems or challenges we think we see. And so that is a long way of saying, yes, everyone has these. And I would say, you know, it's like the Mr. Rogers, look for the helpers, look for the artists, look, look for the artists and let them lead you to where, where those opportunities are. Because so often we think, oh, we have to build something for someone to come and we have to create something. But instead of this idea of place making, or, you know, I, I'm trying to remember there's someone that I presented with sometime and I will have to look up her name, um, but really reshaping that conversation to speak to what is already there, what is already in the place that we are, where are the artists, find them and make relationships as opposed to trying to build something from scratch and we can build it so much better. Yes. Oh, I think that's so um, true and so um, impactful to have that perspective of like this, the richness of the art world and the creative world is right here. And we just need to celebrate and like shine the light on what's going down and find the people and like, let them have what they need to, to run with these ideas. And one of those people whose ideas you ran with, with them was the 50 States project. Right. And that's our kind of like shared connection. And, and that was through Cha, I think, like, can you kind of um, unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So I met Kate, who is a, an incredible painter uh, and also thought leader, project leader, strategist, van builder. Uh, I met her through Cha. She was our resident artist um, the last year that I was there full time. And I fell in love with her work. It's hard not to. And with her, it's hard not to. And um, we just kept meeting up at Cha in, in various ways. I had stayed connected even once I left full time. And as I worked my way through some other development roles, I kept coming back and I was drawn back and I was drawn back. And I remember meeting up with her at one point and we were talking about fundraising for her project. And we looked at each other and I said, you know, one day maybe, and she said, one day, maybe, you know, you'll, you can go off on your own and I'll be off on my own and we'll make this project happen together. And that happened to coincide with when I had an opportunity to leave full-time work and go on to contract with uh, Creative Forces, the NEA Military Healing Arts Network, uh, which was through Americans for the Arts. So again, coming back to something, even though it, it hadn't gone in a linear path, I came back to that work and that gave me the space to then realize that I could finally do what I had sort of thought that I felt but couldn't quite articulate, which is being able to do some national work and local work and be in the community and do all of that at once really, really drives me. And so Kate and I met up again and I said, okay, how can we 
make this work. And so I had the privilege of getting to project manage the 50 states project where these two artists, Kate and Tom, traveled around the country in a camper van that they outfitted, making art relationships and learning about the communities, again, from listening to the communities. And that's why I say follow the artists because they are this, the kinds of stories that Kate has where she's standing outside, she paints a lot of the built environment. So she might be standing in a parking lot or a gas station painting and someone would come up to her and ask her what she was up to, what she was doing. It's the kind of conversation that doesn't happen so naturally for many of us. Um, if someone does come up to you while you're at a gas station asking you what you're doing, usually it's, that would be so <laughs> confusing. I'm concerned. Getting gas, you know, I don't know. Um, so having that as the guiding light, I really was just in a function of support and capacity building and resourcing. And that's how I think of development in general is that it's all about resourcing these ideas, again, that already exist within communities that already are coming from a place of knowledge and need. And where I come in is to be a support for that and a receiver, a recipient of what those needs are and to put it back out as resourcing. So that's how I continue to be uh, connected. And then Kate connected us and now <laughs> we're going to have a scone crawl together. So, yes. and write the next edition of Eloise. I'm not kidding. <laughs> no, I think that's so cool how you make those different um, connections in your story and um, the way that you describe um, through the, the lens of like Kate's experience, what it means to be an artist and a listener. Um, I, I think that like vulnerability, especially is what enables that listening that enables there to be something to listen to, right? Because if you're not first, like putting yourself out there, I don't think that someone else can come alongside you and like share anything. I, so like in that scenario, I think about, you know, Kate standing there with an easel in a Walmart gas station, like, yeah, I can go ask her what she's doing because like this person's weirder than I am. Right. But like in a beautiful, wonderful way. Um, and I think that helps people let their guards down. And I think, you know, you're doing like pivoting to self-employment is another very vulnerable thing that lets you partner with people in ways that maybe they weren't even sure they could do like before that. And so I am excited to now go down this rabbit hole of like what you are doing with national now and for the arts and like military healing. And like, I didn't even know that was a thing. So I'm jazzed. That's it's, such a great point about vulnerability and how the arts in particular open us up to that, that when we're all making art in a space together or making connections in a space together, I think that there's a really powerful thing that happens, which is that um, we make space. And I think that that's, that's one of the, the really amazing things about the arts and what they do is that they help us make space within ourselves too to create something new or to let something out or to be in community with others. And um, I, I love how you said that. So that that is a really good lead into what I do with Creative Forces. Creative Forces, um, the NEA Military Healing Arts Network has a mission of seeking to improve the health, well-being, and quality of life of trauma-exposed military service members and veterans, as well as their families and caregivers by increasing the knowledge of an access to clinical creative arts therapies and community arts engagement. So it really has these two prongs of community and clinical, and then there's also a third piece of that that's capacity building. So the clinical creative arts therapies um, are one side of the house and then I'm on the other though we are very connected and, and try to connect as much as possible. I am the community engagement manager so I've had the opportunity to work with um, a really interesting balance of this national initiative which is through the NEA as well as DOD and VA. So we're talking arts funding and military at the top levels, which is 
just amazing. And another way that we can think of unconventional partnerships or partnerships you might not necessarily expect to be part of the arts ecosystem, but they, they really are because when we think about communities and community needs, this is where I come back to communities know themselves best. I've gotten to work with um, 12 to tw around 12 different locations, site locations that also had uh, clinical creative forces sites. So DOD or VA sites that we had creative arts therapists uh, located in. And then I worked with community-based organizations to work with people who were either transitioning back to civilian life or had family or caregivers who were there or were active duty or in the guard or reserve. And um, all of these different organizations had very different experiences because the experiences of a military connected person in, uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina is really different from Tampa, is really different from uh, San Diego or Austin or Colorado Springs or Maryland, Virginia. And so the opportunity to work in these different spaces from a national framework to, to consider what are some of the top line takeaways from this partnership building and capacity building and uh, shared knowledge, all of these kinds of things that actually are really, really rooted in some of the same things that we talk about when we talk about micro, small community-based arts organizations. And so I think of this support as a continuum, not as two separate things anymore. And I think that that was something that I missed when I was younger, that I thought of these as, as either I'm on the national side or I'm doing local work and I want to be doing both when actually there isn't, there isn't really a distinction for me anymore in terms of that work that when I'm working with the 50 States project or I'm working with CHA or I'm working with creative forces, there are communities embedded in any of those listening to those communities and listening to the artists within those communities and then adequately resourcing them in the ways that we can functionally that might look quite different if we're working with the NEA and DOD and VA that's going to go through a few more steps a few more layers than it's going to if we're working at CHA and we can you know go straight out to DDOT and just say can we install some sculptures or with Kate who can go out and, and make it happen in so many ways um, without more, more levels to go through. So functionally, it looks a little different. Operationally, it looks a little bit different, but fundamentally it's the same process. It's the same listening and it's the same idea that capacity building is really critical and building up the capacity of people who support artists as well as artists. It, it strengthens uh, the whole fabric, really. Yes, I think that your ability to distill like the key kind of themes of what you're doing of the listening and the resourcing, despite all those nuanced differences is what um, I imagine is an important part of what enables you to play in all these places fluidly and as a continuum rather than them being these really jagged separations of your time. Um, and that's really special. Yeah, that's true. I should try to remember that when I'm feeling very jagged and like I'm playing whack-a-mole, <laughs> which happens most of the time, <laughs> but it's true. And, you know, providing arts experiences for different communities, um, again, those who are often under-resourced or don't always have access, I think that's really key in this military work is that um, not everyone knows someone who's connected to the military anymore, though we probably do and just don't think about it in the same way that um, that in the past, probably more people thought about it more intentionally more of the time. Um, but being able to make visible some of, some of these communities and giving more explicit access to this creative engagement that as we were talking about promotes so many really really 
uh, powerful social connections and connections internally to vulnerability, to trust building, to skill building, to creative thinking, to feeling more confident. All of these things are things we talk about, whether it's on a, on a really high level or really on the ground level that the arts do for us. And so I just can't think of a more important way to spend uh spend time resourcing yes i am um, so before i went back to school i was a project manager for about a year and what i i thought it was a really hard thing to be a project manager but what i loved is that i felt um for the first time because of that experience that you know i could go into any situation and find a way to be helpful even if i didn't really know what was going on yeah. <laughs> and i think like i'm thinking about your experience now and you're coming into like the department of defense like and you studied art history and like i don't know if that was ever in your purview of what was going to end up in your story so um i i know that you're able to go in and be helpful i wonder like what you're taking from that experience too like are you learning new things about trauma and military and like is it making you see the world differently also like i'm just i'm excited to hear about that from the social work perspective <laughs> absolutely there's a whole military cultural competency piece that i I am still learning and I feel the same way about the work that I do with mutual aid that there, you know, to go back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, there's always a language and learning that language is really, really critical to being able to be uh, more intuitive about how to help and also to recognize when I need to take a step back and do more learning and do more listening and putting at the forefront that these communities know themselves best and that I can come in with ideas and that, and I can help guide um, or provide maybe insights that they haven't had time to think about because they're doing so much already. That's all true. Also though, I don't have a lot of experience with the military and I am always upfront about that and that I'm there to serve them and that I have had the opportunity to learn. I've taken, there are lots of online trainings, for example, in military cultural competency. I've also learned from a lot of our arts practitioners who some of them are veterans themselves. Some of them are in the guard currently, and they're also artists and they also run arts organizations. And so it is certainly a space where there is a lot of intersectionality and so also understanding the the difference between being a woman in the military or having the experience of being black or brown in the military all of many of the things that we talk about in the world at large also exist within the military but they're a little bit different and so um really trying to have a framework of knowing that we're there to bring something that's really, really useful and powerful, I think, through the arts and that that's something that I can bring to the table and that all of these partners are also bringing something to the table. I mean, I talked about it before with the alphabet animals where DDOT's bringing all of their knowledge to the table. They speak a language that I don't speak. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that sculptures could only be seven pounds or they might pull the light post. And just as I didn't know, plenty of things about deployment, the intricacies of the VA system um, that I'm learning every day, all the time, both from those community arts organizations and from our clinical team. And I said both, but I meant more than both. I also mean from our military partners and from participants and hearing through these organizations, what participants share also has been really eye-opening and um, I think only helps to strengthen what we do in any of our arts organizations because ultimately a goal is also to have people feel like they can walk into any art space and not have it be one that's necessarily specific to the military but to have them say you know what now that I've had this experience I can walk into a cha and feel at home and safe and comfortable. But to do that, there are a whole lot of pieces, um, as you mentioned, trauma and 
understanding how far my own understanding can go or how far any one particular community organization's understanding can go on that and when you need to bring in extra support I think is a good thing to know too Yes, but I think that that whole give and take is such an exciting thing to be part of when we do recognize that everyone's going to bring something cool and that we are going to get to be learners and sharers and all of the things at once. Um, it, it makes me excited for any space that we get to walk into, um, all those people we get to meet and new ideas we get to have. And um, I can imagine that that is such a cool part of what it is to be part of um, the military healing um forced you know project <laughs> that you are part of um the awesome name that I'm never going to get right apparently but that's okay um so another thing I, I want to just like touch on here is I really like understanding that like how it works kind of part of things and you are self-employed and currently like ba- like that means work with NEA but how does how does that all like how do those pieces fit together What does that mean? Like, did you pursue this thing? Did they reach out? So in that case, I, uh, they had put out an RFP and I put in my, uh, response to the RFP, which I had never done before as a private consultant person. And so I used the internet, uh, and I tried to teach myself how to write a good proposal as a consultant and, Um, I sent it in and did an interview and that process was through a very formal RFP process. Um, the other work that I have sometimes is through a process like that. Sometimes it's through, uh, people I know, and then I meet up with someone and we have a conversation about their needs and then I write my own proposal for them and send that off and then we work on it from there. So there are a lot of different ways that it can take shape. And I am still learning it. I've been doing this for now three years. And so I let's chat again in, in another year or two. And I'm sure I'll have learned a few I would love that. Yes. Um, I think that's so cool. Um, and just to even go into things and like know that the internet can help you and that you're going to be fine with giving it a shot, I think is really brave. Like anytime there's a new opportunity, I'm like, ah, like, am I good at it? Like, and if I'm not, I really don't want to do it. And I think that that's just an important first step to end up in spaces that are going to grow you. So that's a really cool part of how you approached this opportunity. Um, as we kind of abstract a little bit, I want to ask you about, I mean, I think this has been a part of the conversation throughout, but really like what you think the role of community engagement is in the arts, because it's kind of everything is what I'm getting. I really, really believe that when, when communities work to support artists in their midst, and provide space for it. And, and in some cases, just don't take away spaces that artists exist everywhere, whether we call them art spaces or not. And that when, when communities can engage with artists and arts organizations by providing more capacity, by ensuring their sustainability, by making sure that spaces are affordable, that that access is equitable, that we have a much broader scope of vision, really, a, a much greater sense of self and reflection back to the community. Because again, communities have the solutions and artists, when they lead, can bring us to even more creativity. And so I think connecting those two brings us so much closer to the kinds of communities that that hopefully many of us want to see of more equity and more accessibility and more um, opportunities to connect and to support each other within communities. Yes, I think that's a beautiful um, thing that we all need to keep uh, aspiring to and working towards. 
um, in our locales, in the big picture, all the things in between. And would you say, um, is there anything else that you would add for like what specifically keeps inspiring you and motivating you to show up and bridge this gap of enabling um, arts to continue and to thrive? I think it's the relationships. It's really those connections between people that I, I think that I have a hand in helping create some of those um, connections. And then some I'm lucky to have connected back with me. And it's, it's being able to see firsthand and support firsthand the people part of it. And I, I realized I said all of these things just a minute ago, and I didn't mention the beauty, the joy, and the whimsy of it, which I think, you know, I mentioned that with the alphabet animals, but I think that's a really positive part of this too. And it continues to inspire me that when we allow the arts to be everything, not put a distinction between community arts and high arts or craft and art or you know I think I think that it's it's nuanced it's complicated that it's also really important to recognize artists as a it's a profession it is an expertise and that everyone's an artist not an artist by profession um, and there's a difference and I think we have room for both. I think we have space for both. These nuanced conversations though can only happen when we have a lot of trust and when we all agree that we want to support the full spectrum, the whole life of the arts. I think often the arts are asked to do everything. They're asked to be a tool. They're asked to be an economic driver. They're asked to be a tool for conversation for equity, for vulnerability. They're also asked to be excellent and high-minded and formal. And they're supposed to give us music and dance and all of these more informal ways that we engage with them. And so something that really inspires me is that there's an opportunity, I think, to better understand how we're all engaging in so many ways with the arts and to say, that we can have this big conversation. We can dive into these details because we're gonna support the arts so much that there's room for all of it. Yes, um, I love that kind of surplus mentality and that making room kind of idea. But more than anything, I love this. Um, I think it was the joy, the something and the whimsy. What was I, oh, I'm gonna go back and listen to the recording and find that three part thing and like put it on a post-it somewhere because especially the whimsy part I think that is just so true that like we gotta have fun too right like it has to come back to maybe sparking joy and thoughtfulness and reflection that inspires the next person to let their artist kind of part of their personality shine and so I think that's a really special part of what you do and believe in um what kind of like wisdom maybe that you have accumulated um, or that you have kind of reflected on would you share with someone who is trying to find their way of contributing to the ecosystem that supports art? <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest, the very first thing I would say, because I've spent a lot of time in development, is if you are able, donate. If it's $5, donate. If it's $5 a month. Amazing. Even better. Um, I really do think that it's a really, really important way that we can put our money where our mouth is when we say that we care about the arts and wanting to support their sustainability. So that's something that I would just encourage everyone to do. And I think that by doing that, find a place that really resonates with you to give that $5 to find that art space, find that artist, find that, that spark for you and follow, follow that, find that place. And then, um, you know, you give a little money, you start going, start going to their performances or volunteering if they have volunteers or 
uh, find some other ways. And I think that's how you start letting the arts lead you um, and bringing a little bit more of that sense of uh, not, not planning so much maybe and just seeing where the needs actually are because sometimes they're a little bit different. And you know, I'd encourage finding maybe an individual artist who could tell you more about what, what their challenges are. Maybe you have some, some skill, maybe you're a bookkeeper or maybe uh, you bring some kind of corporate connection. Who knows? I don't know. I, everyone brings something to the table and it may be something unexpected. It may be not the thing that you walk in thinking that you could contribute, um, but it ends up being a really, a really important one. Uh, so I would say that's a great way to start. And then if, if the goal is to move into a more arts administration role, then again, I, I would say find a place that you love that provides arts in a way that resonates for you. And that may not be a place that has a job opening, but figure out what about it resonates and what are some of those qualities that you could then start finding elsewhere. Um, all the contributions matter. Oh, and talk about it. Talk about it a lot. <laughs> if you're going to give to an arts organization or if you care about the ecosystem that supports art, put it on your social media, email your friends, uh, talk about it, write an article in your local newspaper, let people know that you care about the arts. Call it. I do not have representation in Congress that... Uh, <laughs> can vote on, uh, on on some of these things. But if you do have Congress people, call them, let them know. And we all have local, local officials can be even more fundamental to supporting the arts on a really basic level. So um, call them, let them know. These are some things that, that we can all do yes. and make a big difference. I think those are such a rich um, examples and ideas and I'm so glad that um, we went there. So thank you. And I'm thinking about, you know, like at the forefront, some people might hear that and be like, that's really like selfless or whatever. But I think there is a selfish gain to it too, of like, once you kind of, I mean, investing in something, you know, intensifies your passion for it, like your interest in it, like it does have you, it leads you to show up differently, I think. And um, I think it's really beautiful for people to get to experience the arts as an invested member of it rather than like a passive kind of um, onlooker really um, can open your eyes, I think, to new experiences. So um, I hope that there's some new um, or more even um, comp um, passionate um, contributors following this conversation um, when they listen and hear all these great ways that they can get involved too and write letters and contribute, etc. cetera. Um, so finally, Hannah, as we're wrapping up and it's been so much fun um, and I'm so thankful that we've been connected because now I just want to know your story and follow your journey for infinity. Um, <laughs> I would love to ask, you know, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and what and your work and what are you looking forward to right now? I think that what I want to leave us all with is this idea that when the artists lead, we get somewhere that might not be where we expect, but that is a more creative and more fulfilling place to be. And it's something that I challenge myself to do and really believe in. And that making these connections across unlikely spaces can also lead to broadening the scope of what we think is possible. And again, I challenge myself to do that along with saying it out loud um, in this space. And I'm looking forward to more unexpected projects and things that resonate and surprising or not surprising things that come back to me that, that I might've 10 years ago said, 
that is what I'd be doing in 10 years. I love that too. I'm, I'm really, I'm looking forward to finding more ways to be engaged with the arts through all, all of the things that we, that you mentioned in, in my job description, which isn't so much a job description as a collection of words that I have, have thrown at you, but how boards can support the arts, how different kinds of organizations outside of the arts can be part of our whole ecosystem of, of supporting artists and how they lead and their vision and listening to the communities around them so that we can become more collaborative, creative and, and community oriented people here. So. Oh, that's so cool. And I believe that the arts are in a better place because you are part of their ecosystem. And I think that um, you've said so many cool convicting things to get us all excited about, you know, having a more active um, role in the creative spaces that surround us and seeing them as such. So I really appreciate this opportunity, Hannah, to know your story and I'm excited to share it with this other pocket of the world. So thank you again. Thank you so much. I just very lastly, something you just said, the arts need us, we need the arts. It, it's both and, and I've just loved being here, getting to talk through all of this with you um, and to be connected with you. This is the magic of letting the artists lead is that they lead to connections like this. Yes. So thank you. Oh, thank you.